Amen. If you take your Bibles tonight, let's go over to Acts chapter 13. As Brother Wiggs mentioned a moment ago, if you're listening online, if you go to the blog, Barnabas, a model for service, you can see the manuscript that we have before you there. This is actually a summary. When I was working through the manuscript, it came out seven pages single-spaced, and I thought, okay, I think maybe uh, we won't, I won't uh, double overload people today. And so what I decided to do was just go through and try to summarize the things that are here. The way we're looking at Barnabas is as the son of encouragement. And what we'd like to do tonight is especially look at him in terms of his servant leadership to see if we can get a handle on what was it that made him tick? How, how was it that he functioned? And in so doing, learn, as we talked about this morning, how that he could be a trailblazer for us. That was a fascinating concept this morning to think of pre-living life, life lived in advance. And what it reminds us of is what we have in the word of God in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. It says, according to his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The very reason that we have the scripture is to be able to have this wonderful guide as we press ahead in these days. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive right into Acts chapter 13. Lord, what a joy it is tonight to gather together as a people of God, to be exhorting and encouraging each other. Dear Lord, help us, we pray. Help us just to be full of the Spirit, full of the Word of God, letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom. I pray tonight, Lord, that you would fill me with your spirit and fill our dear dear people as they listen with the spirit of God that would give us new boldness in these days. There has never been a more important time in our lifetime for us to learn to be bold and learn what it means to trust in and rest in the spirit of God. So dear Heavenly Father, tonight, would you do a magnificent work in us? And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Rather than reading the entire book or the entire chapter here of Acts chapter 13, what I'd like to do is just begin to work through it little by little. I will point out that you have a distinct change. You could almost call it a sea change, if you will, here in the book of Acts, exactly at this point between this morning's message and tonight's message. What you have is a change because up to this point in Acts chapter 1 through Acts chapter 12, very strong emphasis was there not on preaching the gospel to the Jewish people. But we began to see in Acts chapter 11 that changed. Actually, Acts uh, 10 and 11, that began to change, began to see little glimmers of it. And then what you have here in Acts chapter 13, it really comes into full force. The, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ go into all the world and preach the gospel really becomes into full force here in Acts chapter 13. We read this morning in Acts 12 verse 25, uh, verse 24 and 25, but the word of God grew and multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now, I pointed out this morning, I think it was uh, during the service to say, as you read for tonight, take a really careful look at the names and the, the order in which they are named, because it becomes really intriguing in this particular passage to see that there's a switch and to ask, why was there a switch? And, and how was there this switch that was made so easily? So you can see it there in verse 25, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. It's very, very plain that Luke, as a writer of history, has first and foremost, he has Barnabas in his mind. And he's saying basically Barnabas and uh, Saul, whom he recruited, Saul, whom he uh, introduced to the apostles. He recruited him in Tarsus. They went with him that, that, Paul, that Barnabas is the recognized leader. And even in, ver- in chapter 13 of verse 1, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as, and who's listed first? Barnabas is listed first. Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger or Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now, there is some fascinating biographical information right there in verse 1 that we won't go into tonight, but I would encourage you in your study Bibles to go back and study. At the very least, what you see here is this is a diverse, pardon me, a a diverse ethnic group that is at work working here together. 
And it's very, very interesting to see, and the first principle we have in tonight's message is this, that servant leaders like Barnabas, they function very well as part of a team of leaders using their spiritual gifts. Now, a lot of times we think in terms of, well, there's, there is the pastor or, or the preacher at my church. And I have to tell you, that's not necessarily a biblical way of thinking. You have Barnabas here, here working together with all of these others. And different scholars will take this different way. They say it's grammatically possible to treat the first two or three as prophets and the rest of them as teachers. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really fit. The easier and more natural way to take this is that they were all prophets and teachers. They were all, shall we say it this way, preacher teachers. Now, you know, as you look at Acts chapter 11, you remember there that a man named Agabus, back in Acts chapter 11, back in verse 28, a man named Agabus, who was one of the prophets, came, and he actually was given divine revelation, and he actually foretold the future. He said that there was a famine coming throughout the whole world. And the natural way to take the prophet, as you go in the Old Testament and all the way to this point in the New Testament, is to say, well, these are prophets who are given divine revelation. So up until and through the apostolic age, you had prophets who were given divine revelation of God. Revelation is the communication of a body of truth that was not formerly known, that, that they were given revelation from God, especially while the scriptures were being completed. And you can see evidence of that in Agabus, who, as I say, was able to foretell the future. That's one way that a prophet could be taken. You could go to passages like Acts chapter 5, and when Ananias and Sapphira tried to lie to Peter, you actually see Peter using that gift of a prophet to basically call their hand and say, you're lying. Now, how was he able to do that? You don't find the, the apostles detective agency where they were able to go through and, and find out you know, who, who is lying to us. It was really given to him by the Spirit of God to know that the people right in front of him were lying. Now, if they were prophets who were foretelling the future, then they were certainly under the governance, under the principle that you find in Deuteronomy chapter 18. We won't turn there tonight. It is listed in your manuscript. Deuteronomy 18 is a messianic passage where Moses said, the Lord will send a prophet like unto me. And you remember that they even ask uh, the Lord Jesus, and I think they even asked John the Baptist, are you that prophet? In other words, they wondered if he were the one that, Paul, that Moses had prophesied. But a little later there in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 19 through 22, it tells us that if prophets prophesy and their, prophet, their prophecies do not come true, then in the Old Testament, in theocracy, they were to be stoned to death. If, if in the New Testament you look at this, you didn't have the same governance or uh, political situation going on, at the very least, they were to be recognized as false prophets if their prophecies did not come true. Now, today, we are awash with this. There are people all over the place, both men and women, who claim to be prophets, and they're prophesying or foretelling the future. All you really have to do is go through and find out, you know, is that, did that really happen? Is that really true? And if what you recognize is that uh, their prophecy, any prophecy, did not come true, then they ought to be recognized as a false prophet. And that's a pretty important principle for all of us to recognize because they're claiming to have divine revelation. And so up until and during the apostolic age, you had these wonderful men and women of God. Deborah, remember, was a prophet. You had, you had prophets who were basically the foundation for the church. In fact, hold your place there and go over just for a moment to Ephesians chapter 2 because this is very helpful for you and me today to, to basically acknowledge our, uh, our appreciation, our thankfulness to those whom the Lord has used. Look what it says there in Ephesians 2 verse 19 as he is describing the church and he says, Ephesians 2 and verse 19, Now therefore, Ephesians 2, 19, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. To whom is he speaking? He's speaking to the Gentiles. 
we are now fellow citizens with those to whom the promises were given. Verse 19, now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. What's he speaking of? He's speaking of the church. And catch this in verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built or builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so as you go back to Acts chapter 13, we're actually extremely grateful for these who the Lord used as prophets. You say, okay, that was up until and during the apostolic age. What about today? This is fascinating because the Bible teaches us that the gift of prophecy goes on to today. But what are we talking about and what are we not talking about? We're not talking about being given divine revelation. There is no more communication of a body of truth that was not formerly known. But there's more to being a prophet than merely foretelling the future. There is also the forthtelling, it's been called, telling the truth, being bold with the truth, being able to speak the truth very powerfully to someone's conscience. It's really fascinating over in Romans chapter 12 when it lists the gifts, and we talked a little bit about this this morning, that the very first lift, uh, one that is given is the gift of prophecy or being a prophet. And it's speaking of the gift of prophecy, which means that this person has a dynamic way of presenting the truth to the conscience of others. By the way, I think that you would conclude if you work through those passages, this is not just for men, this is also for women. Because what they're talking about is in personal relationships and in their ability to communicate a dynamic truth, it comes across in a way that it actually helps to get it right down to whatever the issues or the secrets of the heart are. Not everybody agrees with this, but in Romans chapter 12 and verse 9, as he is listing the applications of the gift. So he, he tells you, uh, he waits on prophecy, ministering, uh, a, fa- a proportion of faith, teaching, he lists in there. And then he says this, and this is really, this is really helpful if you, if you agree with this application, that the very same order in which those gifts are given in Romans chapter 12, that the, the applications are given. And if you accept that, then here's what it says about prophecy. It says, let love be without, it says in the King James, dissimulation. The idea is, let let love be without partiality and without hypocrisy. I say to you, because I am very well acquainted with people who I believe have the gift of prophecy. They just have this ability to get right to the point. I mean, it's it's just like in any conversation, it's just like, boom, they just cut through the fog and they just cut to the chase and just boom. I mean, they're right there on it. While others might be a little bit more tentative, others using, by the way, spiritual gifts might want to say, well, I mean, let's talk about this. I mean, some would love to, some would love to teach, some would love to exhort because they are naturally motivated and gifted to do that. But there's something about the gift of being a prophet where you just go right to the heart of the issue and just kind of you know, cut through all the other stuff and just go right to the issue. I do believe that is the way that it comes out in 1 Corinthians 14, as I tried to illustrate and apply in last Sunday morning's message, that in 1 Corinthians 14, here's what it says. It says, if all prophesy, okay, now remember the context. The context is that Paul is drawing a distinction between speaking in tongues, speaking in a language they didn't understand in the church, and actually speaking the truth in a manner that people in the congregation really understand. And by the way, he's not just talking about getting up in a pulpit. He's just talking about using the word of God naturally. Because after all, he says, if all prophesy, if all use the word of God this way. Remember what he says there in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 24 and 25. He says, but if all prophesy... 
and there come in one that believes not or one that is unlearned, he is convicted, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Now, you may be saying to yourself, how does that happen? I mean, I understand that 1 Corinthians 14, 24, and 25 says that, but let's, let's see if we can work this out at Calvary Baptist Church. How would that be evident today? Think about it this way. What if you really were to concentrate on trying to get that one thought every day out of God's word? Now, what would happen to you? Well, we know as we get into the scripture, it is a revealer of the secrets of the heart. What does it tell you in Hebrews chapter four? It's alive, it's quick, it's powerful, it's sharp. Uh, all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The fact is, when you get in to start reading your Bible, your Bible starts reading you. And before long, as you are, you're there with the Lord, you're, you're before long, you're saying, well, wow, Lord, you really know all the secrets of my heart. There have been times when I was really wrestling with some things. And I remember one particular time, I just couldn't even, I woke up and I just couldn't even sleep. And so I thought, I've just got to have an answer. And I went into our room where we have a little fireplace there and I was sitting on the mantle and I was reading. And folks, I'm telling you, it was as if, the very eyes of God were staring into my soul as I was reading this. And I, I was recognizing, whoa, the Lord knows everything about me. I mean, he, he knows every motive of my heart. He knows every thought that comes into my mind. And wow, I mean, this is just so powerful that he is unveiling the secrets of my heart. Can you see how that if you concentrated on trying to get that one thought, which it, it turned you around, it, it unveiled the secrets of your heart, can you see how eager you would be to share that with others? You're not going to them and saying, by the way, I would like to unveil the secrets of your heart. I, I don't recommend that approach. I recommend the approach that says, I need to show you, here is what the Lord is showing me. And it's, it's actually very powerful. I mean, he's, he's radically transformed my life by learning to think in this way. I was remembering a situation, praying about when to insert this illustration. Many of you know, we had a man here in our congregation whose name was Joe. He is now with the Lord rejoicing in heaven, playing his trumpet undoubtedly in heaven. And when I first got here, we got to be pretty good friends because I grew up with, or I, I was in school, I should say, in the university with his son. And that really struck up a relationship immediately between us. And I hadn't been here, oh, I'd, I'd been here probably less than two or three months. He said, hey, let's go to lunch sometime. So we went to a steakhouse to get a salad here close by around the corner where it used to be. And we were sitting there and we were talking and I said, so Joe, what, what is it that you have found recently in the word of God that has really meant a lot to you or really transformed your soul? I'll never forget, I'll never forget the way he was chewing. And he was like this and he kind of chewed with his mouth open and he said, uh, uh, Nothing's coming to mind. I said, well, let me tell you what the Lord's been showing me. And I just began to really pour out what the Lord had been showing me in devotions in the last couple of days. Okay, I didn't know this happened at the moment, but he told me later, here's what happened. He said, I made up my mind while I was sitting there talking to you that you would never ask me ever again what I had in devotions that day without my being able to give you a fresh new answer of what I'd learned in the scripture that very day. We saw the most amazing change in this brother. It was astounding. People were commenting on it. When I first came here, um, we, you know, we were talking, nominating committee and things like that. Whenever we got to his name, it was always passed over like, mm -mm, you know, he's, he's offended some people, so mm -mm. And just before he passed away, it was a rather tragic accident in which he passed away, there were people who were saying, you know, 
He has changed so much. I think he'd make a wonderful deacon in our congregation. I think, I think people just really enjoy being around him and enjoy hearing him share the word of God. At his funeral that was conducted right here in this auditorium, his children told me and said, Pastor, we've never seen a guy change like that before. We, we have, I mean, he's our dad. I mean, we've known him for, and we, we've never seen a man change as much as our dad changed. Your friends, I say to you that every one of us here could be like Joe. Every one of us here could basically make up their mind. You know, I, I'm going to get serious about that. And I'm going to let the Lord radically transform my life. I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. You have no idea. Uh, this is what I was really driving at in this morning's message. You really have no idea how that could affect the people around you who desperately need for you to be that way. One occasion many years ago, I've told you the story before about some young men, this was in North Carolina, who egged my car. Uh, now, if you'd known how poor I was at the time, I mean, I was poorer than Job's house cat. I mean, I had like nothing. And these teenagers from the youth group egged my car. And I figured out, in fact, I saw them, uh, I heard the noise, and then I went outside and chased him around town uh, for an, an, a, a few minutes. I tried to catch up with them. Uh, they had a Trans Am. I had a, a Chevrolet Monza, so, you know, it's not going to work out real well. But um, I was furious. I was absolutely furious. I ended up calling the police, talking it over with them, and they said, if you want to, since you saw it happen, if you want to file something, you can file something. I said, okay, I'll pray about it. I was so angry I was so mad that my digestive system did not work well for about two or three days. I'm just trying to be as transparent as I can tell you. I was that ticked. I was that mad about what had happened. And, uh, you know, I was talking to other people about it. And I said, man, I just can't believe it. I mean, I got nothing. And here they go and egg my car. And just, I was so frustrated. I can still remember exactly where I was in my frustration. As I was driving along in my car, I cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, you showed Moses a tree. And when the tree was thrust into the water, the waters were made sweet. Lord, would you, would you show me how, how that could just transform my soul? Folks, I'm here to testify to you. It was like a divine antacid that went over my system. It, it was like just almost immediately something happened, like almost like, you know, Pepto-Bismol, but I didn't have any. I mean, it just, it just kind of just took over. And, and I was like, ah, whoa, thank you, Lord. I, I needed to get a hold of that. I'd heard Dr. Stuart Custer preach a message on that text probably by that time, maybe four years before. And it's interesting, at least one of the applications you can use of that passage is that if the tree of Calvary is what has made our waters sweet, I'm not sure that's the exact right interpretation of it, but an application, you could do that way. So the Lord helped me to really settle my soul. And I thought, okay, I'm going to pray about this. And so about another two days later, I uh, made up my mind, okay, I'm going to go. I called, uh, I called the family and uh, immediately, <laughs> immediately mom or dad, I don't remember which one said, what's he done this time? And I said, well, uh, maybe could I just come by and, and talk? And they said, sure. And I went over and was able to sit in that home and just began to talk. And what I began to talk about was Folks, um, you know, I got really, really angry and the Lord had to really deal with me. And I just got to share this verse that he, he shared that the Lord helped me to see and understand. And it, it really changed my soul. I mean, just really changed my whole attitude. It's one of the reasons I'm sitting here right now. I mean, they were all of them were just kind of sitting there looking at me like, so what's this all about? And I turned to the young man, his name was Charles. And I said, Charles, you know what you did. And I know what you did, but your parents don't probably don't know what you did. Why don't you tell them what you did? Folks, he not only told what he did to me and my car, he also told us about a whole bunch of other people in the community that he did the same things to. Uh, that explained why, why wherever you went, there were egg cartons on the side of the road. I mean, he was doing, he was doing a lot of egging, egg, egging people on, but not in the right way. And he just opened up and began to talk about it. 
And it was, oh, I forgot to tell you what was interesting was that when I asked him something, his parents said, Charles, do you understand that the man who's sitting in front of you really loves you and wants to help you be a success? And I felt like saying, yeah, you should have seen this guy a few days ago. He was ready, he was ready just to pound on the guy. But he said, do you see that he, he really does want to help you? And he just opened up and began to talk about all the things that happened. His father was a drunkard, and about, uh, about six weeks later, his father was so drunk that he ran over a motorcyclist on his motorcycle and didn't even know it. They had to stop him blocks later to say, you got to come back here because, I mean, here's what you've done. And, and, and he was put into prison shortly after that. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about how the Word of God can change you. It can change me to help us be ready and able to minister to others. It's the value of really trying to concentrate on getting that one thought every day out of God's word and then using it that way. It's interesting over in Acts chapter 15 and verse 32, it tells us a little about the function of what a prophet, how, this, how he actually functions. And it mentions Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves. What did they do? They exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. You, you get the idea that they, they stabilized them. They, they exhorted them and they, they confirmed them, stabilized them. In, in the words of what it said about Barnabas, he exhorted them that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now just stop for a moment to think through what I'm saying here. Do you have any idea how many of your fellow believers desperately need this. How many of your fellow believers need to hear it from someplace other than just the pulpit? They need to hear it from the members of the congregation. If it's something from the pulpit that's been preached, praise God. If it's something that can be used, it's one of the reasons we have services, is to draw attention to the word of God. But the great need of the hour is that we would embrace the word of God and then use it in that way. As a result, we could all be like Barnabas and this team of people here. These were, these were preacher teachers. When I was a staff writer years ago in North Carolina, we were analyzing our team. And we were, I still remember my boss was analyzing, and he mentioned one fellow whom you know who preached here, who's preached here. He said, he's a preacher, preacher. And then uh, he was talking to the other end, and he said, and this fellow over here, who was my immediate boss, he says, he's a teacher, teacher. And, and then he looked at me, and he looked at him, and he said, you, he said, I'm more of a preacher, teacher, and you're more of a teacher, preacher. And I thought, what a, what a wonderful way to kind of analyze the way the Lord used every one of us. And by the way, I think the Lord was, was really using the entire group. You just never do know, but the, the important thing is being a team, coming together in unity, and watching how the Lord can use every one of our gifts. Well, not only that, but you see in verses 2 and 3 of our text, as they ministered to the Lord. By the way, it doesn't say as they ministered to the people. I found that kind of fascinating. It was basically saying as they worshiped the Lord, as they prayed, as they worshiped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Leaders like Barnabas know that leadership is built on worshiping the Lord, seeking him fervently by prayer and even by fasting. They prepare themselves for the challenges before them. Now, I'd ask you to hold your place here just for a moment to get a context for this. Paul made a commentary on this over in Galatians chapter 2. So could you turn over there just for a moment as you think about how exactly did this work? For instance, was this a brand new idea to them that perhaps the Lord wanted to send them out on a mission trip to the mission field, especially to the Gentiles? Well, here is Paul speaking in Galatians chapter 2 as he's commenting on this. And he talked about how Barnabas and he went up to Jerusalem. Uh, that's in verse 1. 
And he said, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. In other words, Paul was saying, was saying I, I, didn't, I didn't want to be a famous personality. I, went, I didn't want to be you know, thought of as a big preacher. I just wanted to go and sort of compare notes with them. He says, neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. He said in verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection, know not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Just to comment on, on this, and we'll come back to it. There was a Jerusalem council that we're going to read about just a little bit later in Acts. What's interesting is the findings of that Jerusalem council are not mentioned in Galatians. What that leads us to believe is that Galatians was written before that took place. And so it's probably right around this time that the Lord is starting to use this in in the life of Paul. He says in verse 6, But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatever they were, it makes no matter to me, God accepts no man's person, they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, that is the gospel to be preached to the Gentiles, was committed unto me as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. And you say, what did he mean by that? He meant that the Lord was especially working in him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and in the very same way the Lord was working in Peter to preach to the Jewish people. He says in verse 8, For he that wrought effectively in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Now here's what I want you to see in verses 9 and 10. And when James, now we have a little problem there because we read in Acts that James was killed by Herod, so which James is this? It's not, it is not James, the brother of John. It's James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus that he is speaking of. He says, when James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace of God that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen. We should go unto the Gentiles and they unto the circumcision only that we should remember the poor, the same which we were also forward to do. So as Barnabas and Saul went down to Jerusalem, delivering that wonderful relief that the believers at Antioch had sent down, they said, let's take the opportunity to have a a little conference here with Peter uh, and James, the Lord's brother, who was the pastor at Jerusalem. You can read about him in uh, the book of James and John, and let's, let's talk to them. And that's when they really realized, here's what the Lord's doing that Barnabas and, and Saul had a very earnest desire to preach unto the Gentiles. Okay, now back over to verses two and three. You can tell when they get back to Antioch that the Lord is still working on this. He is still showing them they are sensing God's calling. And so as they are, as they're praying, as they're fasting, as they're earnestly seeking the Lord, it becomes more and more evident. Have you ever been that desperate to find out what the Lord wanted you to do and then do it with all your might. You know that in the Psalm, Psalm 34, isn't it, that he says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You can know for the reason, know what it is that you are wired up to do. Some of you younger people, you're praying about, what does the Lord want me to do in the future? Here's what he says. He says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. You say, how does that work? One of the easiest ways for me to illustrate that is, remember the last verse in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 says, our God is a consuming fire. So think of it this way. If you delight yourself in the Lord who is as a consuming fire, one of the things he's going to do is he's going to fry off the grease and fat of your ambition, your self-deception, your lust. All these things could really trip us up as far as what is it I'm really supposed to do? And am I, am I fooling myself right now or is this really true? I mean, what does the Lord really want me to do? As you delight yourself in the Lord, 
He will show you. He will show you what it is that you are put together to do. And many times, it's what you really enjoy doing. It's something that you're like, yeah, this is, what I, this is really what I want to throw myself into. As you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desires of, their, of your heart. Well, that's exactly what he did with Barnabas and Saul. And now the Holy Spirit is speaking to all of them saying, separate unto me. And this is an intriguing wording here. Look at it in verse three. The Holy Spirit now says, separate me, Barnabas and Saul. Okay, keep that word order in mind because it becomes very significant. He says, separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Now, what's intriguing is, and let's just kind of run down the list there, shall we, just for a moment. Go back to verse 1. Who's mentioned first in verse 1? Well, it's Barnabas. In fact, if you go back to uh, 12.25, Barnabas and Saul, right? You go to uh, chapter 13, verse 1. He mentions Barnabas. You go to verse 2. It says, this is again the Holy Spirit saying, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul. Go down to verse 7. What do you find? which was the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for, and for whom did he call? He called for Barnabas and Saul. But then begin, watch what happens here in verse 13. It says, now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. Oh, Oh, wait a minute now. Go back to verse 13. What happened to Barnabas? Where is Barnabas? Is Barnabas still part of the team? You read on in Acts, you realize Barnabas is still part of the team. Yeah, but, yeah, but, what's this in verse 13 about, now when Paul and his company, what does that tell you about what is at work here? In the sense of Ephesians chapter five about submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, but even more, go down to verse 43, Acts chapter 13 and verse 43 It says, now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. Now he's being listed first, verse 46. It mentions, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. Look at verse 50. The Jews stirred up devout women, uh, devout and honorable women, chief persecution, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas. There is something going on here that we really need to carefully think about. And if I had to put it in just a couple of words, these are probably the couple of words. The selflessness of servant leaders. The selflessness of servant leaders. You do not see Barnabas objecting. Excuse me, excuse me. Remember, Holy Spirit mentioned me first. You know, so, hey, you know, Get back in your place there, Paul. And by the way, his Jewish name was Saul. And, and being from a Greek region, he also had the, the Greek name Paulus. I don't think there is something special that happened to him because of this commission. I think he was, that's the way he was known and chose to use his Greek name among Greek people. But you don't see Barnabas saying, wait, 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 wait. I'm the leader here and I've got to be in charge and I'm the one. You just don't see it. That's why I say there is something marvelous that is happening here with the selflessness of the servant leader. As I put in your notes there, the servant leader selflessly delights in seeing his own followers take a higher place of leadership and follows them willingly. And that's exactly what Barnabas was doing. He was was following him willingly. He began to realize the amazing potential that he had in the man that he was discipling. And when the Lord began to take over and the Lord began to say, look, send this man out to preach, you find Barnabas saying, Paul, go for it, man. It's not like I have to be first. It's like, Paul, throw yourself into it. That is one of the more beautiful illustrations of servant leadership I think there is anywhere in the scripture. And I think the spirit of God is signaling something to all of us to help us all realize this is the way all of us ought to be. <laughs> let, let no man think of himself more highly than he ought to think, it says in Romans chapter 12. To think soberly according as God has given to every man a measure of grace. That selflessness will take us far. I can't remember the name of the man who helped to put together the European Union years ago. 
And when he was putting it together, he made this comment. He said, there is no limit to what a man can accomplish as long as he's not worried about who gets the credit. It's when, it's when we're insistent on getting the credit, that's when it kind of throws the monkey wrench in the whole works and all of a sudden you have to stop and do deference to somebody. What if we could just be a team where we selflessly throw ourselves into the task and if somebody else is, is given a, a higher place, glory to God. I mean, this would, be, this would be a wonderful way to approach life. But of course, there is something that's tragic right there in that very same verse in verse 13. It says, now when Paul and his, and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia and John departing from them returned unto Jerusalem. Ouch, that had to hurt. I mean, this was, this was the nephew of Barnabas whom he had recruited to come along on this trip. And we can only speculate, and it's, it is an argument from silence, we can only take a guess about this, but apparently what John saw in this, uh, John Mark saw in this confrontation with this false prophet whose name was Elymas, you see back up in uh, verse seven it says, uh, I'm sorry, verse six, and when they were gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. And uh, Paul basically just, just called him. I and mean, he was used to the Lord just to confront the man right there on the spot, showing, by the way, that he really did have the gifts of an apostle. But John Mark had said, uh, uh, not for me. Now, the story is not over there. We'll come back to John Mark. For now, let's just say it suffices to remember failures are not finished. That's going to be a point of disagreement between Paul and Barnabas later on. But failures are not finished. From the standpoint of servant leadership, leaders like Barnabas will press on with the mission even when those who are close to him turn away from the mission. That's a really helpful point to remember, especially as others do not continue to, to work with you or they say, I, I just don't know that I can do this right now. It's really helpful to remember that you and I can still press on. Servant leaders like Barnabas and, and Saul really delight in the preaching of the gospel of God's grace. Uh, I was thinking about this the last couple of days that what we were talking about with uh, they met with them an entire year. Barnabas and Saul met with the church at Antioch for an entire year. And as I was praying about this, I thought, you know what that involved? involved it had to involve homework. It, it had to involve the people getting into the word for themselves. And that's the way the Lord really uh, stirred up some people that way. So if you are willing, here's some homework. I think you might enjoy reading through the message, the sermon that Paul preached here. And I would just point out that Pastor Rod and I have taken really great delight in continually finding this emphasis. And, and quite frankly, if, and I'm going to be totally transparent with you about this, we've actually sought for more and said, are we missing anything? I mean, do I, can we really legitimately put, put everything in this evangelistic message under these five categories, and so far, both Old Testament and New Testament, we're basically saying, nope, there it is again, that, that each one of the categories is sufficiently broad and sufficiently narrow to say what's going on here. So here's homework, if you'd be willing to take it. Read through that sermon in verses 14 through 43, and we believe that what you will find is you will, you will find the glory of God, including the promise of the Messiah, the rebellion of mankind, verses 27 through 29, the awful penalty for that rebellion uh, of mankind in verses 40 and 41, the Christ who paid the penalty for the rebellion of mankind, verses 30 through 39, and the appeal to embrace Christ by faith today in verses 42 and 43. In fact, it says down in verse 43, Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. That, that way of thinking about the gospel, G-R-A-C-E, the glory of God, the rebellion of man, the awful penalty for that rebellion, Christ paid the penalty for our rebellion, embrace Christ by faith today, is at least a way of thinking when, when you are sharing the gospel with someone. And of course, you know, I think it'd be possible to write an entire book about 
all five of those areas and just illustrate it with, with passage after passage after passage from the scripture. But I just throw that out to you that you, what you really see is he is rejoicing in this. And by the way, you don't see Barnabas scolding Saul and saying, or scolding Paul here and saying, hey, Paul, you're using too much scripture in your speech. You, you really don't find that. What you find is he is so thrilled to have the word of God being preached that what we need is we need more of the scripture, not less of the scripture, that it's the word of God that really does have that dynamic effect on all of us. What did Jesus say? It is the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I give unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Well, to wind up, let's go look at verses 43 and 44 here in Acts chapter 13. And just notice as they come to a, a natural breaking point, we might say, it says as they were preaching, as he was preaching the gospel of grace, verses 43 and 44, now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes, those who had, those Gentiles who had become uh, Jewish people, uh, following the Jewish way of thinking, followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And it says, the next Sabbath day came the whole city together to hear the word of God. Look at verses 43 and 44 and just think about what this would be like. That as people get excited about the word of God, when they're, I've mentioned to you getting that one thought every day, but I mean, as, as Barnabas and Saul, or in this case, Paul and Barnabas, I'm gonna get the order here mixed up, as, as Paul and Barnabas are just sharing with them, people are beginning to say, yeah, I mean, this is so important. This is so crucial. And they're beginning just to talk to conversationally with people about this all the time. That's what the Lord wants every one of us to do. Okay, I've teased about this before, but here it comes again. Sir, you're sitting in the barber chair. And as you're sitting in the barber chair, what are you, what are you saying? You're looking at all the men around you and you're saying, oh Lord, please, now please, please, Lord, please help me to talk about Ohio State football or Michigan football, I'm sorry. I, it, Lord, please help me to talk about football. You say, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's, people just, they come up and just start talking conversationally about football. What if the good news of Jesus Christ and what if the Bible were the same way for us? What if it was just so much a natural part of our thinking and just the way that we do things that we just start sharing the scripture and just start sharing, oh, that reminds me of, of this verse. Think about what would happen. And what happened there in verse 44, it says, the whole city started coming together to hear the word of God. Here's the principle. The servant leader will use his words to help others grow strong in the grace of God, knowing that they will be used of the Lord to reach other people. That is exactly the model that you see of overflowing into the lives of others that the Lord wants all of us to see. This is about the precious good news of Jesus Christ, which has transformed our lives, given us a new understanding, newness of life in the words of Romans chapter six. And it's also given us, Barnabas, a wonderful model for service. Now, all day long today, we've been talking about this. And so I'd just like to ask you, will you follow your guide? Will you, will you follow a trailblazer like Barnabas and watch what the Lord could do through your life? Shall we pause together to pray? Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity tonight just to gather around this passage of scripture and to see the truly remarkable work of our Lord in the life of Barnabas, the way the Holy Spirit led Barnabas and Saul, and then to see Paul take the lead and Barnabas to be a willing follower, submitting himself to him and in the fear of the Lord. Lord, it is just such a marvel to see teams come together like this and to watch that selflessness of the servant leaders. I pray today, Lord, that you would help all of us to be exactly the same way, that you would help us, help us to selflessly learn to lead others by serving. And Father, we praise you and thank you for what you will do. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.